The way we lead impacts the way people live. This world needs truly human leadership. I'm Brent Stewart, your host. Thanks for listening. This podcast is an outreach of Barry Waymiller. You can connect with us on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, and Twitter at Barry Waymiller and find our podcast articles and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. You're listening to a Truly Human Leadership podcast refresher where we reshare insight from podcast episodes from the past. I cannot be accused of being a crazy idealist of imagining a world in which people love going to work. I can't be accused of being out of touch with reality to believe in the possibility of a world in which the majority of company leaders trust their people and the majority of people trust their leaders. I can't be an idealist if these organizations exist in reality. That is what author and optimist Simon Sinek wrote about Barry Waymiller in his book, Leaders Eat Last, something he has also said on numerous occasions. Simon came to know Barry Waymiller after meeting with our CEO, Bob Chapman, who invited Simon to visit a couple of our facilities. Though skeptical at first, Simon was touched by what he saw and wrote about those experiences. Years later, Simon and Bob have become good friends and allies in creating a movement to change the way business is done. In the foreword to Bob and Raj Sazodia's book, Everybody Matters, The Extraordinary Power of Caring for Your People Like Family, Simon writes, A lot of leaders talk about this. See what happens when you actually do it. We're giving you a front row seat as Simon and Bob have a conversation about some of the themes of Everybody Matters, the book. How leaders in business should create caring family environments. So pull up a chair and listen to a conversation between Simon Sinek and Bob Chapman. My work, you know, is not about business. My work is about human beings. And I'm I'm personally fascinated with why we trust each other. What does that even mean? Everybody knows trust is important. Everybody knows cooperation and strong culture is important. But what does that actually mean? And, uh, you know, our species evolved... Um, designed to take care of each other. I mean, we are no good by ourselves, but we are spectacular in groups that we trust, where we, where we feel trusted and we trust others. Um, and you and I share um, a philosophy, a belief, that, that we can have a profound impact on the world through business. And for me, it's, a simple, it's two simple reasons. One, that's where all the people are, which is even when unemployment reaches record highs, 10%, I think, it reached nearly 10% during the, the last recession. What I hear is that 90% of people still have a job. The vast, vast, vast majority, even in the most recessionary times, still go to work. And so if you want to get to the people, get to them at work. Um, not to mention the fact that business is the new tribe. You know, we have our families, and then we also have our places of work. And we are members of both these tribes. And we take care of our families and we take care of our loved ones and we build a strong sense of family then why not are we building a strong sense of belonging and trust and cooperation at the places we work and of course this falls on our leaders to build those environments just like it falls on a parent to build parents to build the environment for for their own family um how did you come to the conclusion how did you realize that connection mine was through the study of anthropology and how did you come to the conclusion that a family and a business are basically the same thing? I, um, in, the, in the late 70s, Cynthia and I got married with hers, mine, and ours. And uh, that's a significant responsibility and a challenge to bring together a blended family and try and create a loving uh, family. At the same time, I had a kind of a challenging business situation, a 100-year-old business that was struggling financially, struggling to have a future. And so I was applying over here all the ideas through my education, undergraduate in accounting, graduate MBA, my experience at Pricewaterhouse, what I'd learned outside. I was trying to deploy traditional methods of management over here. But over here, when you try to be a good parent, when you learn to be a good parent, it's about caring. Mm -hmm. Okay, it's about the profound sense of responsibility for those lives. Mm -hmm. And so I would say to you that over this 80s and 90s, I. It was an ev- evolution of my awareness of that really leadership and parenting is identical. Mm. In fact, what I learned about being a good parent trumped what I learned about being a manager. Mm-hmm. Because, you know, again, you take management classes, you get a management degree, you mm-hmm. get a job in management. So what do you try and do? You manage. try to manage people. Mm. I was taught 
that it was always about me and my success. I was never taught to care for others. Mm -hmm. I was taught to use others. You mm -hmm. need a receptionist, you need an accountant, you need a salesperson, and you may even be nice to them and remember their birthday, okay? And send a note to them, and you might be viewed as a very compassionate leader. But when you have a, a family, it's not about being nice. Caring is a profound word. And you learn that in being a parent. It's not about being nice to your kids and giving them what they want. It's about being a good steward of your children to prepare them for life of meaning and purpose. Mm -hmm. so what I realized in the late 90s, awoken, but you know, and again, uh, a couple of words I'd love to eliminate. I'd love, the word, I'd love to eliminate the word management, boss, and supervisor, and create mentor, coach, and leader. Because when people are described as a boss, supervisor, manager, they try they to play behave. That role. Yeah, they're playing, and, yeah. and words are very important. And so, you know, our hope is, and, and so it became very, well, it's very clear to me that that day when I realized that everybody that works for us is somebody's precious child who we have in our care for 40 hours a week and that the way we treat them will profoundly affect the way they live. Mm. It never occurred to me, I've never read it, I never heard it, I never thought it, mm. that the way we lead in business affects the way people live their personal life, mm. affects. Mm. And, and without question, when we send people home, the majority of which are sent home feeling that, that we don't care about them, 88% of all people that feel they work for a company that doesn't care about them, three out of four people that doesn't get. We know for a fact when they go home that the way they've been treated affects the way they treat their spouse and therefore the way they raise yeah. their children. So we are in effect materially affecting future generations when we send people home feeling unvalued. So, so you and I agree on the way to do things. And uh, every CEO I talk to will agree with all of this. Mm -hmm. And politicians always talk about, we have to do it for our children. Yet nobody seems to do the right thing for their children. You know, few uh, CEOs actually make good long-term decisions, even though 100% of them will agree that the right thing to do is make the long-term decision. What is the reason in your opinion, uh, that so many people in leadership positions today, even though intellectually they understand the importance of thinking and acting in the long term, don't? You know, um, remember we def define success as money, power, and position. We don't define success as being a good steward of the lives entrusted to you, you know. And so a lot of people say things, you know, you've said it to me a million times, there's great statements, people are our greatest asset, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and, and Enron had beautiful statements about culture and values on their walls. Mm -hmm. But the pressure in our world for instant gratification, for the greed of monetary success, develops a lot of behavior that's very broken, mm -hmm. okay? I don't care what you're doing for the long term. I want to know what you're doing for me now. Mm -hmm. We live in a world where, where lotteries have become, you know, you didn't have to do anything. You just had to buy the right pack of cigarettes at, and at the time get the right lottery number to win a million dollars. And we think that's wonderful, okay? Mm -hmm. So we've, we, we've lived in a world where people aren't willing to work for value. So do we have to, do we have to completely re-educate every CEO on what success looks like? Is, I mean, that seems uh, impossible. Well, what we hoped to do uh, is to be an example that you can care for all your stakeholders. Remember in the 60s, and you talk about it all the time, shareholder va value was became the focus and layoffs and yeah, firings late 70s, and all yeah. Okay, okay, late 70s. And, and so the language of business is shareholders. It's not stakeholders. Yeah. We need to change the language of business. And again, right now, again, I had an opportunity to talk to a uh, a business school dean, and I said to him, what is your vision for the two years for MBA program you have in your care, these young men and women who are gonna leave your institution and go out in the world and hopefully have lives of meaning and purpose? Mm. What's your vision? Mm. He said, we don't have a vision. We have beliefs that are on the wall. Yeah. I said, well, if you don't have a vision, how do you know what to teach? Mm. He said, we teach what the market wants. Mm. And I said, dean, if you ever ask me to be on your board of directors for this graduate business school, which I'm convinced you will not after this conversation, I would shut down your institution on day one of being a board member until you understood what is it we are trying to do mm -hmm. in the time we have these mm -hmm. young men who are gonna to become tomorrow's leaders, are we gonna give them the skills, mm -hmm. so whether they go in the military or the government or business or nonprofit or medicine, 
they can become leaders. Mm. People who profoundly understand the impact they're gonna make on people's lives. Because right now, all we're doing is giving them tools. So we can't change the CEOs until we ch change our view of what leadership is. Mm. Because they're playing the game that's been defined by the investors. Mm. You know, you'll, you'll see an institution announces 5,000 people let go, share price goes up mm. 3%, great job. What about the 5,000 people that let go? It's just business, who cares? You know, it's what we do in business. You know, we occasionally we need to kind of eliminate kind of the dead wood. And so we have this inhuman way of looking So business. what's the alternative? Because I hear this all the time. To care. I hear this all the time. To Give care. me a specific example, right? I hear this all the time. I talk to CEOs and they, and I, and I get on my high horse about the damage layoffs do to culture and trust and all of this. And they come back with, Simon, I had no choice. We had no choice. We had, we were, we lost money. Our share price was down. The, I, I had no choice, which is clearly nonsense. Of course, there's always a choice. But if they feel that they have no other option, what other option do they have? If they need, to, if 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 they lose business and or the business or the economy hits uh, a recession or something, and 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 they have to tighten their belts, like what options do they have? Well, what you have know, you done? The difference is, in in my view, is that. It goes back to kind of a, a, a statement that I've come to. Jim Collins, I think, said in Good to Great uh, that we need to get the right people on the bus, which is a philosophy we have. It kind of goes back to the GE model. You need to hire the smartest and brightest and get rid of the bottom 10% and continue to look for the top 10%. I disagree with that as a way of inspiring CEOs to behave in the right way. I believe we have to build a safe bus. Safe bus is a business model that is well designed, that is going to withstand the challenges you just talked about. And we need to train drivers in good, drive, good safe driving uh, qualities in terms of driving a bus, but also to, to know how to have a navigation system to know where they're going. Because no matter, if, if you don't have a safe bus, which is a good business model, robust business model, that cares for your people, you can't protect your people from what you just talked about. So what, what you're talking about is a failure of a business model. Mm. Okay, it's not the failure of the people. Mm. It's the failure of the business. Now we take it out on people. So what you're saying is, from years and years of running a bad business model, confronted with this challenge, they default to something that's easier, quicker, as opposed to having spent the time to build a, a, a sustainable business model? It's part of, part the companies of the are gonna suffer. It's companies part of the are, muscle memory yeah. of businesses. You know, I, I remember, you know, I, I had many times in my life where we laid off people to solve that because that's what we're taught to do. Yeah. It's accepted behavior so, in our society. So this is Matter of fact, you go to CEOs, go to dinner and have a, you know, hey, see, saw your share price up. Yeah, you know, we had some tough decisions, but you know, it's just business. So we, we don't fundamentally start with the premise mm -hmm. that we are stewards of the lives and trust. But this is, very, this is very interesting. This is why I think it's important to tell your stories. Um, what I think is so interesting that you seem to suggest is when CEOs say, I had no choice, what they really mean to say is, um, no one has taught me that there are options. Like, I'm unaware of case studies, and through my MBA education, nobody told me that when you s taught me that when you face these set of challenges, here are some of your options, of which layoffs may be one, but it may not be the first choice, nor should it be an easy choice. Um, uh, last resort or extreme choice, it should be. Um, um, what I find so fascinating is that sometimes not even when companies lose money, they just made money, they just missed their projections, and that way, they, and then they have layoffs. Well, I mean, I think, that's yeah. fascinating to me. But, but, so what I think is so important about telling your stories and, you know, for somebody like you to write a book is to share with leaders or people in leadership position that there are options. And the best part is that these options have more profoundly positive impact than the options you're choosing. I'd like to tell the story. Um, of when your company suffered uh, significant setbacks because of the 2008 recession, the choice you made. Um, and it's one of the stories in the book, um, which is you had you lost 30% of your orders uh, because of the stock market downturn. And like many businesses, your board got together and said, we need to save $10 million. We can't afford our labor pool. We need to have layoffs. And because you don't uh, see your people as head counts, you see them as heart counts, and it's very hard to, re hard to reduce heart counts, you refused. And instead, your company implemented a system of furloughs uh, where every employee was asked to take uh, four weeks of unpaid vacation. They did not have to take it consecutively, and they could take it whenever they wanted. Um, and it was how you announced the program that I thought was so profound, is what you said to the, your people, it's better we should all suffer a little 
then any of us should have to suffer a lot, and morale went up. And you were suffering the same hard times as every other business in America, um, maybe more than some because you're in manufacturing, which got hit very, very hard. And yet you laid off zero people, but the company still is able to find an alternative way to save the money um, by reducing its labor force, except it was just asked to share the burden. What I know in my work about trust and cooperation is that shared hardship, shared uh, uh, struggle, actually makes trust go up. You know, somebody dies in the family, the family comes together. The nation suffers a national tragedy, the nation comes together. That hardship, shared hardship, actually brings us closer together. Um, did you know that that would be the result? Um, like, what, what surprised you after you made that? Even though you knew that was the right thing to do and it turned out to be the right thing to do, you ended up saving $20 million, as I understand it, mm -hmm. and, your, and the labor pool, like I said, morale went up. Um, was there anything that happened that surprised you that you didn't expect after that experience or during that experience? I don't know how we would have, I don't know what we would have done had we not embraced the guiding principle of leadership. And I was out, so a little bit of the background of the decision is I had been out prophesizing these guiding principles of leadership for three or four years mm -hmm. all over the world. We care, we care, we care, and all of a sudden this environment hits. And because of that, we instead of just doing, you know, if, if you cross your knee and I tap your knee, your, your leg would kick. Layoffs are just a natural reaction. We don't even think about it. You know, it's just a layoff. It's just, it's just business. It's okay? what you do, yeah. And so it was, but get, because we've been prophesizing on the guiding principle of leadership and measuring success by the way we touch the lives of people, I sat in that hotel room in Italy and said, if we measure success by the way we touch the lives of people, we're going to really hurt people mm. if we do this. And we can't do that. Mm. And so it forced me to think, because I'd never heard of furloughs in business, never occurred to me. And it was just an immediate, but if, if you have the right foundation upon which to reflect, instead mm. of just saying, what's the right thing to do? So we went back to our guiding principle of leadership and we came up with this idea. I, I honestly, it was developed so quickly as a reaction mm. to my passion. Mm. I didn't think about, do you think it'll work and that'll work? I just sat in my room and said, we're gonna do this and a few other things to get through this together, mm -hmm. okay? And it's just, and, and I sent a message back to America. I said, I'm gonna, on my way back, by the time I get there, think of how to deploy this idea because we need to do it thoughtfully and, 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 and quickly. Mm. By the time I got back, the team had thought through it, debated, and, and, and I sent a video message, and my message was, we care about you, mm. and we need to get through this together. And so, and I think that was the power. There's no question that a good culture was dramatically enhanced by that initiative, because yeah. what you do in the most challenging times is more a statement about who you are than what you do in good times. Yeah, I, uh, I heard a, uh, a senior executive at a very large public company recently say, this is astounding to me. I, I hear all your leadership stuff, you know, uh, but I don't have time to do all that. He said, because, because of, this is a war, he said to me. Every day I have to wake up and I have to fight a war and I don't have time for this, right? Firstly, it's not a war. Uh, I can introduce him to some soldiers, Marines, Airmen, and Sailors who would say this is not even close to war. Uh, it's simply business and no one's gonna die and it's just about money. That's what it is. You'll make some money, you'll gain some money, but even the business is not gonna collapse, not when you have a business that size. Um, so A, it's not war. Um, but B, even if it were war, let's take cues from those who actually fight wars. Those who actually fight wars understand that if the people don't trust each other, that that, that will create conditions where people die and that's when you fail. And so what I find so astonishing, and I, and I literally, I'm trying to figure out where it comes from. The number of people in executive positions who literally do not understand or see, fail to see that taking care of your people is what results in successful business. And maybe it's just the pressures to have short-term results that everybody's driving. Maybe it's a failure of parenting of the previous generation that they raised an entirely selfish generation. I don't know. I have all kinds of crazy theories. But I also think that anyone who says, we don't have time for this leadership stuff, is it's an even greater indictment on their company because the question I ask then is then what were you doing when times were easier? What were you doing when money was flush? What were you doing when the business was rolling in? Like, what were you doing? Like, did you, you had time for all this leadership stuff then, why weren't you doing it? Um, because as you know, leadership cannot begin in the time of stress and strain. It happens 
prior so that when the time of stress and strain comes, the crew comes together. We don't judge the quality of a, a crew, how they perform in calm waters. We judge how they come together in, in rough waters. Um, and that's a very different standard than I think wh the way we sort of view, view many, many businesses today. Um, who, who are some leaders today, and I'm curious your opinion, that you, would, that you really admire, who you think are with us, who are preaching the good word and trying to change the way business works for the good, quite frankly, of people and of business? Um, who are some of the personalities, some of the leaders today that, that you look at and say, I think, let's look at these people, for example. I'd like to say that I have a handful of people that I am aware of that uh, believe what we believe and are moving in that direction. Uh, I met through you, some uh, through our massive events, some uh, really thoughtful people. Uh, Kip at Container Store. Kip Tindall at Container uh, Store, yeah. Uh, Angel at uh, Decker's. Angel Martinez, CEO of and, Decker's, and, yeah. And, and, but they're both in those two cases, Public companies. very genuine companies clearly are very, uh, you know, to me, have the challenge of now being in the public arena, meeting, playing the game in the public arena that you're required to play. And you remember, board of directors and CEOs are getting all kinds of investment advisor advice on things you got to do to maintain the trust and confidence of your investors, not your team members. Mm. Okay, not your team members. And so I would say to you that when a CEO would say to you, I don't have time for all that leadership stuff, mm. My response is you have time to do what any, everything that's important. Mm -hmm. And I would say to any CEO in this country, if the statistics are even close to right, that 88% of all people feel that they work for a company that doesn't care about them, that three out of four people are disengaged in mm -hmm. what they're doing. If I look at most of the organizations you're talking about, we have people that are doing their job, mm -hmm. whatever it takes to get it done, but they're not thriving as an organization. And our responsibility as leaders uh, with the people and the opportunity that we ha are cared for is to make sure that all of these come together in a thriving environment uh, so we can we realize whatever the potential of our idea is. And when people like you and Bill and all the other, Raj and, and Srikumar, all the other people that have come to visit said, I've never seen anything like this. Mm. And that's why, and it's not just our incredible culture that is evolving, mm -hmm. okay? We are not anywhere near where we want to be. Mm -hmm. we, and I know, every, you have, I know you have very strong examples of your culture and you have some examples that, that we could be much better. That you could be much better, and, yes. And uh, I always say, what are we doing well and what could we do better? Yeah. And that will never, we'll never stop asking that question mm. because no, the idea of continuous improvement is every day we can come in mm. and we can be better. Better stewards, better with our clients, better with our communities. Mm. So I, I think this, the problem is that CEO is just playing the game that has been defined for public, for most companies. Yeah. Even private companies play it in a way. Yeah. It's all about, I just heard this expression the other day that I think embodies it. It's all about products and profits. Mm. They forgot the other piece, mm. the other P, people. Mm. And we call it, you know, people, purpose, and performance. But they all say it. They all say it. Like, I, I can't tell you how many, and I, I try and tell people that the order matters, and this is what I admire about you, which is, this is not a charity. You know, you have a, a business that you run, and it's a very, very successful business with numbers that would make most other CEOs uh, uh, jealous, quite frankly. Um, this is not this is not just some you know uh, airy fairy you know uh, uh, hippie thing that you're doing. This is this is serious stuff. Um, uh, and what I what I find so fantastic is that so many uh, CEOs they all say this stuff. I can't tell you how many I, I've sat at the back of the room of countless CEO presentations where they put their priorities on the wall. Number one, growth. Number two, shareholder value. Num number five, people. You know, <laughs> it's always on the list. Sometimes it's lucky enough to be number two, but it's always on the list. And I try to remind uh, uh, leader people in leadership positions that the order matters because the order will determine what we sacrifice. Because it's there's always an order, and number two always gets sacrificed for number one, and number three always gets sacrificed for number two. That's why there's an order, right? There's no such thing as equals because you cannot make a decision where both things are always considered. So the examples I, I love to sh give is, is this, which is, imagine if I said to you, 
Our number one priority is growth. And of course we care about our people. And if we take care of our people, we will achieve our financial goals. Or our number one priority is our people. And if we take care of our people, of course we'll achieve our financial goals. Which company would you rather work for? Both growth and profitability is important. The difference is that one considers people first, and it's such a stupid example, of course we'd rather work for the second company, right? And so what I find fascinating, though, though you can put it on the list, if you don't actually prioritize it, no one believes you. And so they work to protect themselves rather than working to advance your business. And you talk about CEOs not having time for this stuff or executives not having time for this stuff. This is war or whatever analogy they use. They're also suffering record low levels of engagement. And they're suffering record low levels of uh, innovation. You can't just yell at people to innovate. You know, if people are going to offer their ideas, they have to feel safe enough to offer their ideas. Um, so the, the irony is that they are suffering the very thing that they've created. The world is always, is always balanced. Um, you can't just give people free breakfast and now they're engaged. These are human experiences. Trust, cooperation, engagement are feelings. Innovation is my desire to take a risk and give you everything I've got. But when you've created conditions that if I stick my head up, I could get it cut off, I'm certainly not going to take any risks. Innovation goes out the window. Your company uh, and all the companies that we, Angel, Kip, the companies that we admire, Next Jump, uh, Zappos, you know, a lot of these companies that have very effective leadership, um, they're very, very innovative. And it's, it's interesting to me that, um, um, that if, if you want to drive innovation, if you want to drive efficiencies even, run a better company. You'll run a better company when people look for ways to do their jobs smarter. I'll be darned. I know, as opposed to some top-down, externally implemented, you know, efficiency product. Um, I'm just always fascinated by the, the, just the, the, the backwards logic. They say one thing and do another. But it's, always, they, it's always on the list. People are always on the list. Yeah, but Enron, Three, had, it all, Enron had it all over it the did. building, okay? It, it did. Integrity but, was but, all over but, their But putting their it on values. a list doesn't mean you live it. Right. It just looks good, right. okay? And, and again, I, I think... So uh, what is the kind, how do we create a, a population of CEOs? Is it just about changing the incentive structures? Is that, is that all it's going to take? How do we create a population of CEOs who have either gone through some personal experience like you and others where they discovered it or they learned it in a school like how do we create a population of CEOs that understand that that it's actually good for business Gary Ridge from WD40 gets it you know that they actually understand deeply inside their inside their souls that if you put people first your business will be more successful over the long term how do we create that population well, I, I, I'm going to go back to the statement that uh, we came to, which was people, purpose, and performance. And I don't know of a better way to say, put it, you talk about things being in balance. Uh, and the reason people is first, is the word people is first is because people are first. And that's your profound sense of responsibility for the lives entrusted to us. You use the example, in the military, we honor those who give themselves in service of their country. And in businesses, we give bonus who sacrifice others in service of themselves. That is the contrast. You know, we are taught to use people. We are not taught to care for people. Until we begin to teach, and that's why I go back to my, my business school. Until we say, what is our goal of giving somebody an MBA? Okay, it's now called a master's in business administration, not master's in business leadership. Okay, mm -hmm. and until we give them the, the tools the feeling. The administering of business. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Of business. So we go yeah. out and play the game that we are told to play. You can't play a different, you can't decide to drive down a highway a different way. You're going to get killed. Okay. Mm. You got to drive on a highway in the direction people are going. And, and you know, in theory, speed, the speed limit. So if we're going to change direction, we got to go back to the education system. Mm. And so if we don't know why we offer, you know, if we offer classes the market wants, we are perpetuating brokenness. We're giving okay. kids candy. Exactly. Yeah. And, and, and we're breaking. Until we start creating leaders, mm. leaders eat last. You know, the military creates leaders, people who are profoundly committed to taking care of the men and women whose lives are entrusted to them in combat, etc. We understand that. Mm. You, you said it at your coca speech. Why don't leaders in business have a profound sense of responsibility for the lives of the people entrusted to them? Because they don't. They think of their shoulders and they think of their board. And the game is very well defined. And what you want to do is you want to stay safe. Yeah. I'm going to protect myself, you know. And that's the key. Their, their role is defined by this game and yeah. they've got to play it. And if you don't play it according to the game, you don't get a chance. 
So, you know, I would say to you, the brokenness that starts in our education system. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's this movement in our lifetimes through generations to, to greed, okay? I want it and I want it now. Mm -hmm. And I'm gonna play the game to get, because that's success. That's who we hold up. Mm -hmm. And remember the, uh, the Aspen Institute this summer, uh, this New York Times op-ed columnist said something that was profound when he said- David Brooks? No, it was, uh, 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 but his statement to the Aspen Institute, while we do good in the world, could we do less harm? Yeah. Okay, so I would say to you, that is to me the message. We yeah. have a lot of people in corporations who write big checks to charity and we say, good job, nice job. You're, you're quite a person, the ch check you gave the United Way or the Cancer Society, wonderful. And then you go back into the business and you treat pe don't treat people with dignity and respect mm -hmm. and you're doing more. So we're, you know, we're actually, if we could focus on, I, I said in that leadership conference we had in New York, the greatest act of charity is caring for the people whose lives are entrusted you, yeah. not the checks you write to see. Yeah. But what we celebrate is people who write big checks. Yeah. And this, this op-ed columnist said, while you're doing good, could we do less harm? Yeah, that's true. And so, and to me, that that message is a profound message because we define good as monetary, yeah. okay? Not as touching people's lives. And so, could we do less harm? Yes, we could do less harm. By simply shifting, as you say, in Leaders Eat Last, why can't business leaders profoundly to their day fight for and care for and create that circle of And these safety? are just choices. Leaders in position of authority have choices to make. And they are not bound by some, some tightly defined set of rules. They have choices. And the courage to stand up to the outside pressures is what leadership is all about. Doing the right thing, not just for the people, but it's also the right thing for the business. And gaining the support of others. In and doing gaining support right. of the others. Because okay. you can do the right thing, yeah. but not communicate thoughtfully with the people who you need the support yeah. of. And you can, so so that's, that's it's, it's, it's a delicate balance of, an, uh, you, you need to have the support yeah. Uh, of, of your stakeholders, okay? And you need to create a vision of a better future where people feel safe. And, and you know, what we try to be in Barry Wimler is because we feel we've been given this amazing gift of the way the world could be. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a precious gift we've been given. And to validate and protect that, we have got to create value because the minute we become a marginally performing business, the credibility of our message goes away. Mm -hmm. So to get it up in the spotlight, we have got to perform at exceptional levels, uh, and which gives us an opportunity to go out and invite others into our organization to do the right thing so that we can protect all the people whose lives are entrusted us, our stakeholders, our suppliers, mm. our board members, our, our, our team members. So I would say to you, leadership, remember, I, I gave that speech out in California and uh, 150 presidents of companies, and at the end of it, I said, does anybody disagree? And, Again, CEOs. Nobody disagrees. Yeah. Nobody disagrees. How do you disagree with what yeah. I said? But then I said, uh, just ask me a question. So the guy in the back of the room said, Mr. Chapman, I, I agree with everything you said, but boy, it seems like it would be hard to do that. So, and I think that's a statement you'd heard yeah. from any CEO. It is, and I said, it is hard. Leadership said, is not easy. Oh, really? Leadership is really, really, really <laughs> hard work. And uh, you, know, like you can't cut corners. It doesn't actually make, it doesn't make for strong organizations. Well, it's I, that's hard the, work. So, but, I, but again, when the guy said that, I never had that question before. I said, are you married? Yeah. And he said, and I said, <laughs> yes, I am. And I said, do you find being married easy? Yeah. And the guy kind of put his head down and not knowing what to say. And he looked at me and said, no, it is really hard to be married. And I said, what human relationship in life of meaning is easy, yeah. okay? You're right, it's hard to care, but what's the alternative, yeah. okay? There is no alternative. It is hard work to be a leader. It is hard work to be a parent. It is hard work to be a spouse, but human relationships are the foundation of our existence. And unless we work hard, and the harder we work, the easier it gets. Yeah. People thought when our company got bigger, it was gonna be hard keep this culture. Remember, most people look at our organization, the combination of 79 global acquisitions say, it's hard enough for me to think about how I do it for my 500 people, but how do you do it for 11,000 yeah. people in all the different cultures? I said, it's the easiest thing we do, and they can't believe that. And I said, all you have to do is care. Yeah. And care does not mean being nice. It means building a safe bus and developing leaders who know where they are and where they're going and, and how they're taking people to a better place. Bob, thanks so much for taking the time. Um, 
you know, for anyone who uh, wants to learn sort of what a company looks like that I theorize about and how to build one, um, I highly recommend and strongly recommend um, read this book. Um, um, not only Bob hasn't, only hasn't done it once; he's he's bought eighty companies, so he's repeated this thing over and over and over again, and it works. And uh, and and your 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 results are the envy of of other of other businesses I know, and it's because you 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 know that everybody matters. Um, such an honor to call you a friend. Such an honor to learn from you, see what you've built. I love going on this journey with you, and I can't wait to see what the future holds. Read this book. Read this book. Thanks, Bob. Thanks again, Sam. Don't forget to find us and connect on Facebook, LinkedIn, Instagram, Twitter, at Barry Waymiller. And you can find more podcasts, articles, and videos at trulyhumanleadership.com. I'm Brent Stewart. Thanks for listening.